there's a subset of English called Christianese. Christianese is a way of speaking amongst Christians that generally means nothing to people who aren't Christians, or it means something different to them. For instance, what does it mean to hide the word in your heart? Does that mean when I had my chest split open about five months ago, they put a Bible in there, you know? What's that mean? To be born again, to let Jesus into your heart, to fall on the rock. You see, these are all Christian phrases. We've all heard them. Most of us know what they mean. But for a person who's not initiated in the club, what do these phrases mean? What does it mean to be washed in the blood of the lamb? Or to pray a hedge of protection around somebody? What, what does that mean? And so it, it's words that we use amongst ourselves that we know what they mean, but others might not know. Now, let's be honest. We also not only have Christian terms, we also have Advent ease. <clears throat> I mean, veggie meat. What does that mean? Is it vegetable or is it animal? You, know, you have to ask 20 questions. Here's one. Outside of an Adventist circle, if you mention haystacks, they are going the opposite direction of what you're talking about. I had haystacks for lunch. What are you, a cow? <laughs> Eschatological. This is not a word that's used in the, wor- in the world every day. Signs of the times. People come to the Adventist church and they hear about the spirit of prophecy. What does that mean? These are Adventist terms. The quarterly. Now we all know what the quarterly is, but someone walking in as a stranger who doesn't know the terminology, they wouldn't know what a quarterly is. And frankly, most non-Adventists are surprised to find out that we all have an uncle named Arthur. Right? We all have an uncle named Arthur. For those of you who aren't necessarily from Adventism, there was a set of books named the Bible story and the bedtime stories made by Uncle Arthur. So we all talk about Uncle Arthur. We also all have an Aunt Sue and Uncle Dan, for those of you who know them. We talk about the time of trouble, the mark of the beast, the great disappointment, the great controversy. All these are Adventese. And there are many, many more. And through the years, I have tried to be very careful about using Adventist terms without defining them. And so oftentimes when I use one of these Adventist words, I try to define what I mean by it. And so that helps a little bit. But I've realized that over the last few months, several times I've used an Advent phrase and the phrase is keep your eyes on Jesus or turn your eyes upon Jesus now that's a very maybe Christian term but especially a term that you might hear in the Adventist church a few few weeks ago I preached a sermon on the narrow way was the name of the sermon and it was about the first vision Ellen White ever had in December after the great disappointment in 1844. You see, there are all those Adventist words, right? And in this vision, Ellen White writes this. She said about the Advent believers, she said, if they kept their eyes fixed upon Jesus who was just before them, leading them to the city, they were safe. And that was kind of the climax of the sermon. It was my point. They, they kept their eyes upon Jesus. And as I was actually, this is a very strange thing that happens. As I was actually preaching the sermon, I realized that I would have to preach a follow-up sermon and define what does it mean to keep your eyes on Jesus? What does that mean? How does that practically happen in day-to-day life? How can we bring ourselves to a place where we 
catch a glimpse of Jesus and we keep our eyes upon Jesus because he is invisible. We can't see him with these eyes. How do we keep our eyes on Jesus? It's something that we have to do by faith. Hebrews chapter 1, chapter 11, verse 1, which we read in the scripture reading. Hebrews 11, 1. Paul says this. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it... The people of old received their commendation. Faith is believing something you can't see. Faith is claiming something that you can't see. It's believing something that is unbelievable. And so by faith, we believe in Jesus. By faith, we believe we can see him with our hearts. One of my favorite contemporary Christian songs And it's not so contemporary anymore because it's pretty old. But I am not up on the latest of them. But I really like this song. It says, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. You see, it's not through the eyes of the head It's through the eyes of the heart that we see Jesus. Now, that's interesting because as I was getting ready for this sermon, I got on the internet and I typed in on on Google, I typed in these words, how do I see Jesus? And a group of websites came up, didn't really find any of them helpful, but a group of websites came up that sounded very mystical and started talking about how to have how to have visions and dreams where you actually see Jesus physically with your eyes. And it's like, well, that's not where I'm going. But how do we see Jesus by faith? Even though he is invisible, it says, continuing on in Hebrews eleven twenty seven, it says, talking about Moses, it says, by faith, he, Moses, left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as, as seeing him who is invisible. You see, even Moses understood that you can see God, you can see Jesus. It's, he's invisible, but we see him with the eyes of our heart. It's by faith. And I approach this whole idea from the suggestion and from the premise that Jesus is Findable. He's seeable. He's not playing hide and go seek with us. He wants us to find him. Do you believe that? And if you believe that, then our search for him should be none, never ending until we find him, until we see him. He is findable. But the adversary does not want us to see him does not want us to find him. The adversary, from the very time that you were a baby, began planning ways to keep you from finding Jesus and from keeping your eyes on Jesus. And he has tailor-made a set of temptations for each of you and me. Because what is tempting to one person will not be tempting to another person. You know, the devil has never tempted me with Brussels sprouts. I don't know if anybody is ever tempted with Brussels sprouts. He always tempts me with Hershey bars. He has different temptations. And so I believe that Satan has studied ways to distract us, to keep our eyes off Jesus. And so before I give you what I believe is a pattern or a, or a way that we can live our lives every day to help us get our eyes fixed upon Jesus, I just want to give you a few ways that I believe Satan distracts us from keeping our eyes on Jesus. 
And I don't want to spend a lot of time here because I want to spend most of the time on the solution, not the problem. But let me suggest to you several ways that Satan distracts us and takes our eyes off Jesus. First is just with life, living. Now, I know all of you are busy people because sometimes I try to call you and all I get is your voicemail. You know, aren't we busy people? You know, we, we have too many things to do. There are too many distractions. We run here, we run there. Time is at a premium. And so many times we just depend on Sabbath for a time to recharge our spiritual batteries. But let me tell you, if you're living a life in which you're only having your spiritual batteries recharged on Sabbath, you are running low on energy. You, your, your energy low, battery off light is flashing all week. And then you may get it to green on Sabbath, but by Sunday it's flashing again. You can't simply depend on Sabbath. And the enemy will make sure things come up all week long to keep you distracted from spending time with Jesus in your busy schedule. There are so many distractions. And some people find distractions in the busyness of schedule. Some people find distractions in religion. You know, it is possible to find distractions and worry about the end of time and Pope watching. And, you know, Satan doesn't care what he uses to distract us. He just wants to keep our eyes off Jesus. And so these are busyness of life comes in the way. A second way that Satan keeps us distracted and keeps our eyes off Jesus is by the self. You know, the battle against self is a battle that cannot be won by yourself because you are not stronger than yourself. Only Jesus is stronger than yourself. We want to be in control. Used to have this bumper sticker you'd see. It says, God is my co-pilot. And when you first saw it, you think, that's nice. In actual fact, it's a horrible bumper sticker. Because if God is your co-pilot, who's the pilot? You are. And that's bad. I saw another bumper sticker that said this. It said, if God is your co-pilot, change places. You know, we want to be in control of our lives. We want to be in charge of our destiny. And we have this pride. You know, I'm not really that bad. And so Satan can sometimes help us to think we're not so bad. So we take our eyes off Jesus. The third thing that Satan sometimes uses to take our eyes off Jesus is temptation. You know, there is so much glitz and glamour in this world that when you think about the humble Jesus, he just does not measure up. Let's be honest. And there are so many temptations, so many fun things, so many pleasurable things that steal our attention from Jesus. And I'm not even going to try to give you a list of them because you already know them better than I do. Satan has his temptations when it comes to this tailor-made for you. And then sometimes Satan uses trials to take our eyes off Jesus. Many people experience troubles, trials in life, whether it's health problems or whether it's problems in relationships or money or whatever it is. Many times people experience trials in life and I've seen this over and over again. It's like a fork in the road. It either makes them feel closer to Jesus or drives them away from Jesus because they're mad at him. But Satan can bring trials to our lives and discouragement that drives us away from Jesus. And then sometimes other people can take our, our sight off Jesus. And this can happen in two ways. I remember a few years ago, it's been 20 years ago now, <clears throat> I had a conflict with a colleague and, and it ended up splitting the church in Mount Vernon, Ohio. 
because of some theology this colleague was teaching. And I became so angry and I became bitter in my heart toward this guy. You know, it's difficult for the love of Christ and bitterness to dwell in the same heart. And when, we're, when our eyes are focused on how angry and bitter we are at someone, it takes our focus off Jesus. And then there's another way that our focus can be taken off Jesus. And this happens especially for those who fall in love. <clears throat> it's love, ain't it a wonderful thing? But sometimes young men and young women and old men and old women, for all that matters, can become so intent on their relationship that they all they really want to do is please that other person when really all we should want to do is please God. But other people can take our focus off Jesus. And, and Satan knows that. And so he brings all of these distractions in our way to try to take our eyes off Jesus, to keep us from keeping our eyes on Jesus. So I come back to my question again. What would a life look like if we kept our eyes upon Jesus in daily living? What would a daily experience look like to keep our, to get our eyes and keep our eyes on Jesus? Well, I wish it was as easy as saying, take these two Bible texts and call me tomorrow. You know, don't you wish there was a pill you could just take and, it would immediately make you a spiritual person. That'd be really easy, but it doesn't happen that way. But I'd like to suggest to you here a spiritual prescription of how this can happen in our lives. As I was preparing this sermon, I immediately thought of two books that I wanted to challenge you to read in your life. The first one, is the book Steps to Christ. Now, if you haven't read this book, it is the most incredible book on how to follow Jesus. It was published in the late 1800s, 1892, copyright date. And so some people find it a little difficult to read because of of the way it's written. Uh, A few years ago, there was an updated version put out, which is called Steps to Jesus. And it kind of takes, it kind of reworks the syntax and reworks some of the words. Uh, Both of these books are on the table in the foyer. And if you don't have the book Steps to Christ or Steps to Jesus, I would encourage you to take one home and read it. Now, some of you might have the attitude that that's for baby Christians. But I've discovered that Steps to Christ is not only... Steps to Christ 101, it's also 202, 303, and 404. And 404 is a senior class in college. And I'm not talking about a senior being over 60 years old like I am. But this book is an incredible book that not only helps you, can help you learn how to follow Jesus, but also will help you continue to walk with Jesus. So I encourage you to go back and read this book. I have probably read this book more than any other one book in my life. I've I've probably read this book through about 10 times in in my life. I just keep coming back to it. And when I feel dry and in need of revival, this is a book I come back to. But I also want to acquaint you with another book. It's called To Know God, A Five-Day Plan by Morris Venden, Maury Venden. Now, this book I read about 25 years ago, and as I was preparing this sermon, I immediately remembered this book. By the way, I've read it three or four other times, too. Um, A really good book deserves to be read more than once. So this book I've read at least three or four times, as I say, and It is a helpful how-to guide to know God, to follow Jesus, to to get your eyes upon Jesus and keep your eyes upon Jesus. It is is written in typical Maury Venden style. If any of you have read any books by Maury Venden, 
There are a bunch of copies of this on the table out front. We had some extra copies. I put them out there. If you don't have a copy, I encourage you to take it. I don't don't have enough copies for every person to have one. So take one as a family and share it with each other. But I challenge you to read this book. In this book, in the first chapter, Maury Vanden emphasizes our need of Jesus. Now, this is really important to remember. Because if we don't recognize and remember our need of Jesus every day, why do we want to seek him and find him? Why do we want to put our eyes upon Jesus if we don't realize our need? Oh, I'm fine enough. Thank you very much. So he emphasizes in the first chapter our need of Jesus. And then in the second chapter, he gives what he calls a spiritual prescription. And as I said, I read this book many years ago, and I still remembered, as I was ready to prepare the sermon, I still remembered this spiritual prescription. It made that much of an impact on me. And so I wanted to share it with you this morning. Here is this spiritual prescription of how to know God or how to fix your eyes upon Jesus. Here it is. Take time alone at the beginning of each day to seek Jesus through Bible study and prayer. Take time alone at the beginning of every day to seek Jesus through Bible study and prayer. Now, someone may say, is that all? I was hoping something for something a little bit more dazzling, a little bit more avant-garde, a little bit more contemporary with a little more pizzazz. But this is it. If you want to catch a glimpse of who Jesus is and keep your eyes upon him, here's the prescription. Take time alone at the beginning of each day to seek Jesus through Bible study and prayer. And the rest of the book, the rest of that chapter, he kind of takes each element of that prescription and talks about it. And I just want to summarize quickly what he says on a number of them. First off, he says, take time. Yes, we're talking about time again. Take time, something that most of us feel like we have so little of. We are busy people. I'm willing to admit that. A few years ago, I preached a sermon in, the, in this pulpit and talked about time and challenged people that we aren't as busy as we may think we are and made a couple people mad at me. You don't know my life. Well, I do know that time is a matter of priorities, Many years ago, I used to say, I'm sorry I didn't do that. I didn't have the time. And I realized that's a lie. So now what I say, I'm sorry I didn't do that. I didn't take the time. It's a very big difference because life is a matter of priorities. Let me tell you, if, if anything has proven that we have discretionary time on our hands, it's Facebook. (laughs) Now, some of you know what I'm talking about. Scrolling through Facebook. Actually, it's scrolling through Facebook that direction, isn't it? Yeah, I was going the wrong direction. Facebook, TV, prove that we have discretionary time on, on our hands. And some of that discretionary time could be used to take with Jesus. Take time. And Venden goes so far as to suggest that time, taking time is the place where we need to put our primary emphasis by taking time. And in typical Venden style, he points out, that we don't spend time trying to be good and avoid evil. 
we spend time trying to build a relationship with God, which will in turn help us to be good and avoid evil. So the time is spent on knowing God. The time is spent on capturing a glimpse of who Jesus is and what he wants to do for us and keeping our eyes on him. So he says, take time. Now, the question people always want to know is how long? I don't know. I'm going to read you a quotation in just a little while that says it would be well to take a thoughtful hour. So I think an hour is probably a perfect time. But if you can't afford an hour, if you can't take an hour, at least a half hour. If you can't take a half hour, at least 15 minutes or do something. Maury Vanden uses this phrase about a Bible text and a prayer as your hand is on the doorknob. (laughs) You know, that's the way some people have their devotional life. Take time. I did some um, calculations, which is always dangerous for a preacher. But I I discovered that one hour a day would be seven percent of your waking hours if you sleep eight hours a night would only be seven percent of your day so it's it seems doable he says take time alone keeping our eyes on jesus is an individual responsibility it's an individual matter you know i love corporate worship But if you are depending on corporate worship to develop your spiritual life, you're in trouble. God does not save us by by churches full. God saves us one person at a time. And so it's an individual matter. Maury Vanden tells a story about a man who was known to be a real worrier. And he was always, he always looked like he was worried And one day a friend meets him and says, you look different. You look so calm and at ease. What's different? The guy says, I hired someone to do my worrying for me. (laughs) And his friend says, how could you hire someone to do your worrying for, for for you? How are you paying him? And the guy says, that's the first thing he has to worry about. Now, isn't it crazy to think that you could hire someone to do your worrying for you? It's crazy to think that you could hire someone to do your eating for you? How then could we possibly think that someone else could do our spiritual development for us? I mean, it's an individual work. It's not something you can, you can, you can allow the the preacher or the elder. You know, the old song says, it ain't my brother nor my sister, ain't the deacon or the elder, but it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's an individual work. And so I think that's why he says, take time alone. Take time alone. It's an individual work. Then he says, in the beginning of every day, Jesus' example in Mark 135, he says, in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Jesus' example was in the morning. Now, there are some of us who are morning people and some of us who are night owls. I happen to be a night owl. My wife happens to be a morning person. So that's an interesting thing. So some of us, it's more difficult to, uh, to get up and get going at it. But I'm convinced that the best time is in the morning to have a devotional life with Jesus. Perhaps you'll have to get up just a little bit earlier If you have a schedule, you have to keep and get away to work. But there's nothing magic about morning. Any time is better than no time. But I think one of the reasons I think morning is best is because of an old country saying. 
Some of you might have heard this old country saying. It says, it's too late to shut the barn door when the horse is already out. And that's kind of the way it is with the day. And if you start the day off right with Jesus, then the whole day will go better. But if you don't start the day off right with Jesus, well, things may go downhill fast. So it's too late to shut the barn door when the horse is already out. So I think it is a good thing to do it in the morning. And notice it says, he says, in the beginning of every day, there is an importance of of consistency in communicating with God. You know, you can't just communicate with God once a week on Sabbath. If, um, If you husbands and wives only spoke to each other one day a week, how many of you would I be seeing in my office? <laughs> Lots of you. One of the most common complaints that I hear when I do marital counseling with husbands and wives is, shall I be sexist about this? He doesn't talk to me. That's the, that's the one I always hear. He doesn't talk to me. Well, I wonder if Jesus would say that about you. He never talked to me. So that's why I think the consistency every day. Take time alone in the beginning of every day to seek Jesus. It's all, if we want to get our eyes focused on Jesus, then it's all about Jesus. And let me suggest to you that we should be spending our time in devotional life, time capturing our glimpse of Jesus by thinking about Jesus. This is why I suggest to you that if you develop a devotional life, that you spend the time not reading Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Let me suggest to you, you read Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Read Romans. Read some of the epistles where it's talking about Jesus. Read the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus. Focus on Jesus because as we focus on Jesus, we catch a glimpse of how wonderful he is. If you're reading the books of Ellen White, I encourage you for your breakfast reading to read the desire of ages, read Christ object lessons, read thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, read steps to Christ, read these books. As as heretical as this may sound, I don't encourage you to read testimonies to the church with with your cornflakes in the morning. Focus your mind on Jesus. There are times, other times, you should be reading testimonies to the church, yes, But devotional reading focuses our attention on Jesus. I'll go so far as to say, get myself in more trouble here. I'll go so far as to say that primary devotional reading is usually not the Sabbath school lesson. Although it may be like today's would have been focusing our eyes on Jesus, talking about how Jesus related to people and talking about how we should do that. So that may be the Sabbath school lesson quarterly, but often it's not. So we seek Jesus in Bible study and prayer. I've already spoken of the fact that there are portions of scripture that make it easier to see Jesus. And so we should be concentrating on them. But we also need to come to the conclusion that the purpose of all Bible study is to see Jesus. Turn with me to John chapter five. Here's an interesting interchange between between Jesus and some of the Jewish leaders, John five, verse 39 and 40. Jesus says, he's speaking to the Jewish authorities He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness about me 
yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. You see what's going on here? Jesus is saying, you read the Bible. You're Bible scholars, some of the greatest Bible scholars ever. And yet they fail to see Jesus. They refuse to come to Jesus. The purpose of all Bible study. And by the way, what, what Bible were they studying? What we call the Old Testament. Jesus says page after page in the Old Testament witnesses to him. He says, the purpose of Bible study is to catch a glimpse of Jesus and to keep our eyes upon Jesus. And here's a, here's a possibility Is it possible to be a Bible student and not see Jesus? I know people who are great Bible students, but don't show by the fruits of their life that they love Jesus. And George Knight, some of you know George Knight, who I enjoy reading. He's a little controversial sometimes. But George Knight writes about the sobering possibility of being a Seventh-day Adventist without being a Christian. Interesting phrase. We study the Bible in Bible study and we seek Jesus in prayer. Here's a quote from the book Steps to Christ. It says, prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Not that it is necessary in order to make known to God what we are, but in order to enable us to receive him Prayer does not bring God down to us, but brings us up to him. You know, it's wonderful to have a friend to share with. And it's wonderful to communicate with that friend. I have a, I have a friend who's a teacher down at Southern Adventist University. His name's Barry Tryon. And when we talk on the phone, it's so wonderful. It's just, even though we can't see each other, we don't talk often. That's where my illustration falls apart. (laughs) But when we talk to each other, even though we can't see each other, it's like we're together and it's like no time has passed. Even though it's been six months since we talked, it's like no time has passed. And so there's this wonderful communication that happens between you and your best friend. And that's what God wants prayer to be like for you. You know, if we captured that vision of prayer, prayer would not be boring. Just like talking to Barry is not boring. Prayer is sharing my heart with my best friend, Jesus. And that helps us capture a vision of who he is. Some of you will know this quotation from the book Desire of Ages. It simply simply encapsulates everything that Maury Venden was saying and says this. It would be well for us to spend, you know this, don't you? This quote, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. You see, there's the emphasis on Jesus. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point And let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, listen to what she says, our confidence in him will be more constant, our love will be more quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. If we would be saved at last, isn't that what we're trying to do? If we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. Now, I share this with you this morning, and all of you, not all of you, because some of you know me, but you must be thinking, okay, the pastor is sharing something that he has in place 100%. Eh, Wrong answer. You know, we are all works in progress. We are all striving to come closer to Jesus and to capture a glimpse of who he is and to keep our eyes focused upon him. 
And I'm convinced that if we followed this spiritual prescription, spending time each day in a study of God's word and in prayer, focusing our thoughts on Jesus, we will see Jesus. Join me in this song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and the grace. I'm so sorry we're so late today. But I thought this was too important a subject to cut parts out of my sermon. So my prayer for you is to experience this. Let's just pray together. Lord Jesus, we confess to you this morning, we haven't always sought you as we should have. So Lord, I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to each person here and each morning or noon or night. I pray that you would draw us into an ever deepening relationship with you, Jesus, so that we will catch a glimpse of how wonderful you are, how much you love us, and that we'll never lose that vision. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.